Hey, hey, welcome to the Summit Host Hangout Podcast, where you'll learn how to plan, strategize, and launch your profitable online summit. No influencer status necessary. I'm your host, Krista from Summit in a Box, and I am so excited for today's episode because I am taking you behind the scenes of my most recent summit launch. This one was super interesting to me because where I was making my money had a different focus. So rather than being super worried about all access pass sales, I was more focused on making sure it set up my Summit in a Box program to sell well. Uh, And to give a hint, in some ways it was my smallest Summit yet, and in other ways it was my biggest. So you'll have to stay tuned to hear what in the world that means. So in this episode, we're going to cover things like an overview of how the Summit was set up for those of you who weren't a part of it what went well and what didn't. I will give you an exact look at our numbers, a little behind the scenes look at co-hosting, but we're going to save most of that for another episode. Uh, What I'll keep the same and change moving forward and then the main lessons I learned. So let's just dive right in, shall we? And I'll give a little overview of what the summit was. So this was called Sell with the Summit Course Creator Edition. So it was a summit with the goal of helping course creators reach their biggest course launch yet with the virtual summit. So most of these audience members were successfully selling digital courses and just want to sell more. And I think most of them already had the idea of hosting a summit in their mind. There was a good portion of them who also maybe hadn't thought about it a whole lot, but they're all open to the idea. That's why they came to the summit. It was also co-hosted. So I hosted this summit with Jen from Virtual Summit Search. Uh, We tag teamed on this project. I will link to her in the show notes. She's amazing. If you want to speak at more summits or if you want to get your summit in front of more people, go check out Jen at Virtual Summit Search. So we hosted the summit September 14th through 18th. So it was a five-day event. The first four days, we had pre-recorded presentations all going live at the same time each day. So like all the presentations for Monday went out at 7 a.m. Central on Monday. We didn't have any live chat boxes or anything like that. And then the last day was an implementation day. So it was all live sessions. So on that day, we had networking, co-working. I did a promotion workshop. We had hot seats and a master class. I think I think that was all. And then throughout the week, we had a few things sprinkled in for people who upgraded to our highest tier all access pass. So we had four speaker panels. We had two co-working sessions and two networking sessions in addition. So the presentations were all pre-recorded, but we definitely had ways to interact live. So what the free ticket got people was 24-hour access to presentations. They also got checklists for each section with kind of like action steps or things to review from each presentation. Uh, They got co-working and networking sessions on that last day, the master class on the last day, and then access to our private summit community. Then we had our upgrade options, which was our first way to make money through this event. So we had two tiers of our all access pass, which is a strategy I recommend. But if you're a first time host, kind of overwhelmed with everything, just go with one option. But our lower tier, we called the extended access pass, which got our attendees ongoing access to presentations. So like kind of like lifetime, but we say ongoing because we can't guarantee that they'll have access for their entire lives, uh, as well as transcripts, notes, and worksheets for every single presentation. Our pricing for that was $67 for the fast action price. So for 20 minutes after someone registered, they could get that for $67. Before the summit started, it was $97. And then once the summit started, it was $127. Then our higher tier was called the From Summit to Course Launch Kit. And this had, of course, everything from the extended access past the ongoing access and then all the extras for the sessions. We had over $3,000 in bonuses contributed from our speakers. We had four live panels with our speakers, one per day uh, at the first four days. We had two live co-working sessions and two extra live networking sessions. They could get a hot seat on the last day. They got entry to the promotion workshop. And then they also got a last minute sponsor workshop that an awesome sponsor we had uh, jumped in and contributed. That was Nicole Ware of Empreneur. By the way, she's amazing. So, uh, oh, and the pricing for this was $127 for 20 minutes after someone registered. Before the summit, it was $187. And once the summit started, it was $247, which was definitely my highest price point yet. And we'll get into how that worked. So how this was different from my previous summits and strategies that I teach. So this was actually the first time I've run a new summit, of course, other than my first one. So my previous four, yeah, my previous four summits were all the same 
like same, same summit, same audience, just repeated. So this was a totally new audience, new business, new topic. Everything was new for this summit. So it was really interesting. I got a really good reminder of how all you guys feel planning your first summits. Uh, this was my first do time doing live speaker panels. In the past, I have kind of put those off because I was terrified of doing anything live and relying on people to show up. I guess I can kind of say how I felt about that too. I think I have this later in my outline, but what the heck, let's just dive into it now. I loved the panels. I will so do the panels again. Oh my gosh, it was so much fun to bring these speakers together and just hear them bounce off each other and just deliver incredible value. There are some things I'd like to change and we'll get into that later, but I loved the panels. Something else different from what I teach and what I've done before is that we didn't have a chat box this time. And this was kind of something Jen and I talked about, and I think we ultimately decided not to have one, mostly as an experiment. It might have been that Jen didn't want one, and then I was like, okay, I want to just experiment to see what happens when I don't have one so I can tell you guys how it went. So we did not have a chat box. Uh, I'll wait and talk about that later, actually. I'm going to leave you hanging a little bit. This was my first time co-hosting, which we'll get into a little bit later, and then we're going to talk about it more in episode 98, which will come out in a couple months. Sorry to make you wait. Uh, and then... The biggest difference was the fact that my goal for this summit, for myself at least, was selling my program at the end over making a ton of all access pass sales and getting a ton of registrations, which really came into play when it came time to position the summit and then what we did with everyone afterwards. So in positioning the summit, we did not position it to get thousands and thousands and thousands of attendees. Uh, the course creator audience honestly is pretty wide. Um, usually I wouldn't recommend doing a summit for an audience that wide. And then the fact that we did a summit for course creators to help them launch a summit, then kind of added another level of difficulty to it because it's course creators who know they want to run a summit. And I think summits have an interesting reputation for course creators. So I knew, I don't know, I didn't quite know what to expect, uh, but I knew the positioning was different and that I'd see smaller numbers because of it. So as for how I was feeling going into this, I was terrified, absolutely terrified. I wasn't sure how this audience would work since it's marketed to really heavily. They are very familiar with all the different ways of marketing and it's still kind of a wider audience. Course creators, no one really identifies as a course creator, right? Like I create courses, but I'm not gonna sit here and call myself a course creator. No, I teach about summits. So that was kind of interesting. I wasn't sure how that was gonna work. I also felt a ton of pressure to perform well since my audience for the summit was there learning from me and watching exactly what I was doing, which is what I teach them, like so meta and weird. I felt a ton of pressure for that and I knew I would have to record an episode like this one and I was absolutely terrified. Like, oh my gosh, if this doesn't go well, do you think they'll notice if I just don't record an episode <laughs> kind of thing going on? So uh, definitely scared about that. So overall, like I knew I was gonna create an awesome experience through the summit, that's just what I do, but I wasn't sure where the results would end up and that really freaked me out since there are so many people watching and maybe deciding whether they're going to learn from me or not based on how my summit went. So that's kind of an overview of this event. As for goals, we're going to dive into numbers next, but I want to give you an idea of the goals I had first. So goals for myself, my goal was to have 2,000 people registered for the summit which uh, is smaller based on where I've been going with the other summit I ran. But like I said, I knew that this summit was not positioned to pull in tons and tons of people. So 2,000 registrations was our goal. We were hoping for $20,000 in all-access pass sales and then another $20,000 in some in-a-box sales. So spoiler alert, we did not hit some of those numbers, but we very far exceeded other ones. And I will break all of that down for you. As for my goals for attendees... My biggest one was really just to let them have an awesome time, to make them feel empowered to host a summit, know they can do it, know that they can create an awesome experience. I wanted to show them what a really incredible summit looked like and felt like so that they wanted to do it for their people. Not so I can benefit and sell to them later, literally so they know they can do it and be excited about it. I also had a goal to not overwhelm them. Summits are overwhelming, you guys know that. And I didn't want this to turn into something that was really overwhelming for them. Uh, and I definitely think we, did, we succeeded with all of those things. As for our speakers, of course, I have a few goals for my speakers as well. First was just to create a fun and easy experience. Uh, I had pretty good relationships with maybe 75% of our speakers. So I just wanted to give them, you know, just deliver on the relationship they're used to, as well as give a really great experience to the people I didn't know as well yet. 
I also wanted to get them a really great affiliate payout and grow their email list. Uh, so the speakers who participated and like really showed up, they loved the heck out of it. I have heard so many good things. I actually am realizing now as I'm talking that I have not looked at the feedback surveys yet, but I have just heard nothing but love from these speakers. I did not get them the affiliate payouts I was hoping to get them due to the audience and the way the summit was positioned. I think we'll talk about that a little more. But everyone I've talked to just loved being a part of it and even went as far as saying that they'd have been willing to pay to be a part of it which don't make your speakers pay to be a part of your summit. That's gross. But I just thought it was like a really cool thing for them to say. So that's an overview of the goals. And now we'll get into the numbers. I won't make you wait any longer. So like I said, I knew this was going to be a smaller summit because of the positioning. Course creators are still a wide audience. It's heavily marketed to. Course creators who know they want to host a summit makes it even harder. There are not many people out there who teach about summits specifically, which would have been my ideal speakers for this. And I don't vibe with most of them who do. So we didn't have any of them on, which would have given us the biggest boost in numbers, assuming they would have actually promoted, which they probably wouldn't have. So this meant that we had to go with speakers. I shouldn't say had to, like, uh, our speakers were awesome, okay? So, but it meant we had to go with speakers who targeted course creators rather than course creators who want to host a summit. So I did worry that they wouldn't promote and that their audience wouldn't respond super well since it wasn't a perfect match like I preach, and I was right. Uh, this was not the, the match and response that I'm used to with my other event, and it kind of just uh, solidifies everything I preach to you guys about, about get speakers with the perfect audience who really resonate with your topic and who have people who resonate with your topic. Uh, but like I said, I was willing to trade smaller numbers for a good launch after the summit. Uh, but in light of some recent events, I think we will have had a bonus episode go live before this or it will be next <laughs> in light of recent events that kind of go over this. But I'm even happier because of something else that happened that I went with my gut and stuck with speakers who align with my values over the speakers who might have brought in bigger numbers because that's why this event was as awesome as it was. I had someone ask like, how did you make the really awesome community feel that you made with the summit? And it's because my speakers were amazing. Our values align so closely. I know most of them. A lot of my community also showed up. So that helps a lot too. Like a lot of them knew each other. Uh, and I think, I think I'm just kind of okay at connecting with new people, uh, at least online. Don't, don't talk to me in person, <laughs> but online, I think, I think that's a big part of why it was such an incredible community. So anyways, all that to say, I knew this was going to be a smaller summit overall because of all that positioning type stuff. So we had 26 speakers as well as Jen and myself. We wanted at least 20 in the beginning and then just got pitch happy and kept pitching. We initially had 28 lined up, uh, but one speaker would not get us their information. We were just going back and forth with their assistant for weeks and eventually just removed them. And then one speaker actually just totally ghosted us with delivering their presentation. We still have not heard from her and I honestly hope she's okay. But know that this can happen. Know that people can not get you their information and you have to make a difficult decision. They can totally disappear. You might not like the presentations they deliver and can't let it be a part of it. Have a plan for that going in. So the first speaker we actually removed, we had enough time to remove them from graphics, get their name off of everything before anyone saw it. But the second speaker, like that person's they like their face was on a lot of our graphics. Like we didn't have time to get rid of their information. Some people saw them on their registration page and that's just going to happen. And that's okay. Let that be okay. Don't let that kind of stuff stress you out. So all I have to say, we had 26 speakers plus Jen and myself. As for registrations, I said our goal was 2000. We ended up with 1250. So much smaller than I was hoping for. My smallest summit yet, other than my second summit, like the mini summit I did that was a total flop that you never hear me talk about. Um, but like, I was terrified of what this number was going to mean for final numbers going into the summit. But you're gonna see that when you set up your summit for your program, overall excess pass sales, when that's your goal, the results will speak for themselves. So our registration page actually converted at 83% which is insane. 83% of the people who landed on the registration page signed up for the summit. So to me, that says the people who saw the graphics, saw the promotion, and were intrigued by the idea of reaching a big course launch through a summit, like we were speaking to them effectively because if they got to that sales page, they signed up. So I think that's a really good sign. So 1,250 people signed up, smaller than I was expecting. So let's move on to all access pass sales. So we had, like I said, the two tiers. We had 13 people buy our lower tier all access pass. So 10 people purchased the uh, fast action offer of $67. 
two people grabbed the $97 version and one person grabbed the $127 version. And I'll have this all broken out on the show notes. I know this is hard to follow along with. And then we had 87 people get our higher tier option. So 60 got the fast action offer of 127, 16 grabbed the offer for 187, and 11 got the full price option of 247. We also added a payment plan partway through because we realized this price was, was a little too high and 10 people took us up on the payment plan option for those higher two price points. So we still have 10 payments that will come through uh, in a couple weeks here. So as for how that converted, we had an 8% conversion rate. So this is higher than industry standard, but much lower than what I'm used to and what my students usually see. But again, I knew that was going to be the case. I knew this was going to convert lower. I didn't think it would be quite that low. I was expecting more like 12%. But hey, at least we were able to provide really great value for the people who did grab it. They loved it. So the total revenue from that, what we have so far in our account is $13,680 which should get to about 15,000 once we get those extra 10 payments come through. So smallest summit I've ever hosted, again, other than that mini summit, and I was terrified to come in here and tell you that number until the Summit in the Box launch happened because this entire summit set up Summit in a Box to launch. So I wasn't sure how this was going to go, which was funny because like I was hosting a summit about how to launch a product through a summit and it was my first time doing it and I didn't know how it would go. What I did know is that I wasn't the one teaching that. My speakers were the ones teaching that. So that's what made me feel okay about it. But I wasn't sure how it would go because it's a higher priced, it's not high priced in the grand scheme of how much other programs cost. But I feel like in our industry, it's a higher price product. There's prices ranging from $1,500 to $2,000. And I was like, this could be a lot, you know, for people who just found me a couple days ago, a couple weeks ago, and asking them to make that commitment, that could be interesting. So I wasn't sure how it would go. What we did was make sure that everyone knew it was coming from the very beginning. And I'll talk about this a little bit more after we're done going over the numbers. But we had a scholarship to make it really easy to talk about Summit in the Box. So we were able to weave it into all the messaging really easily. My speakers showed the heck up and they would not stop talking about it. Like I never said anything to them about it. I didn't even tell them we were launching it afterwards and they would not stop talking about it. They're the best. I love them all. If any of you are listening, I love you. You're amazing. Uh, we also only launched to people who showed interest. So I only launched Summit in the Box to people who either came to the masterclass webinar on the last day of the summit watch the replay of it within the next couple days, or if they were signed up to my summit or signed up to the summit and had been on my email list for at least 60 days. So new subscribers who signed up to the summit and did not show interest in anything, I did not launch to them because that felt really gross to me. It did not feel right for me to be like, hey, nice to meet you. By the way, will you give me $2,000? I don't really know you yet. Like that just did not feel right to me. So as for how many people we launched to, we had 27 people come to the live masterclass. So that is a small number. I was bumming during the webinar, I will tell you. But those 27 people converted at 40, over 40%, which is unheard of. That is so cool to me. We also had 380 of our attendees who had been on my list for over two months and didn't already own Summit in the Box. So those people also got a launch sequence. And then I, since I was already doing the work to send these people emails, I also just did a little launch to people on my wait list for the program, which there were 134 people on my wait list. And then 37 people signed up for a duplicate webinar that I did outside of the summit. So of the 6,200 people on my email list and 1,250 people signed up for the summit, I launched to about 600 of them. So a very small, so that's less than 10%. But it was really important to me that this was a launch that felt good to me and didn't feel forced and gross to everyone else. That's just kind of how I roll. So total sales. I will, I'll go over total sales first and then summit specific sales second. And the reason I'm telling you about both of them is because if you're going to launch what you do through your summit and have an existing audience somewhere else, you might as well also just kind of duplicate things and do that launch as well. So we had 37 sales total come in, which is 62,894. Uh, so about $63,000 in sales over a 10 month period. So I have about 11,000 of that right now in the bank. And the rest of that, what is that? 50, the rest of the 50,000 will come in over the next nine months. So I just want to be really transparent about that. It's not like I have all of that sitting right now. As for summit specific sales, 27 of those sales were from the summit specifically, which was about $45,000 came specifically from the summit, which I think is so cool. 
So while the summit itself was my smallest yet, the total combined launch was my biggest and it brought in about $77,000. And I will take that any day of the week. I also want you to keep in mind that I did co-host this. So 50% of the summit went to Jen, as well as about 16,000 of the summit in a box sales. Still not a bad couple of weeks. I think that means that I would have had about 51,000-ish coming to me. Uh, actually, I have that number coming up shortly. So super cool. I was so excited to see that. And I hope this is like inspirational for those of you thinking of launching a product through a summit. Uh, and also just a reminder to all of us that if <laughs> if you do set up a summit to launch something afterwards, don't freak out as much as I did if the numbers of the summit itself are a little bit quieter, especially if you have the summit set up the right way. So I also want to be transparent and talk to you about expenses. And I know some of you are interested in budgeting and stuff as well. I will say that Jen and I, just with what we do, are set up really well to not have to spend a ton of money. Like I run a WordPress development business. I have tons of developer licenses for everything. Jen is totally addicted to like lifetime licenses of things. So she had all kinds of lifetime licenses that we were able to use. So our expenses were not a ton. So we spent about $210 on software and that included Descript, which did like our transcripts and captions and things like that. Jen did have to go through and manually edit them all. But uh, if you're trying to do that kind of stuff on a budget, it's way cheaper than using something like Rev to do human transcriptions. And then also a payment plan plugin for WooCommerce. So um, we had a lifetime developer license of everything else. And that payment plan plugin is not something we planned on doing. I realized a couple weeks in that these prices are just too high for people, you know? And we need something that can make it more accessible. So we grabbed that payment plan plugin and added that kind of last minute. I think actually the day before the summit launched is when we released the payment plans. So a little over $200 on software. We spent uh, about $1,060 on Facebook ads and we made about $1,600 on that. So with spending that $1,060, uh, the way I ran the ads, we did $5 a day to my audience. So I retargeted my email list and website traffic. And then we did $50 a day to lookalike audiences of those. We also tried some retargeting ads for people signed up for the summit who did not buy. And I I'm pretty sure we ended up turning those off. I don't think those were performing well. But we got about 220 people to sign up through that. And then with the all access passes, we made 1600 So our profit on Facebook ads was $600. So I will definitely take that extra $600 we wouldn't have had and over 200 extra attendees. I'm thrilled with that. Uh, we could have definitely spent more, but we just kind of, I don't know, we weren't totally sure and just wanted to be... Be safe, play on the safer side. Uh, we also had about $40 on extra PayPal fees to do affiliate payouts to other countries. 1200 ish went to my assistant. This is really hard to estimate because she's a full-time employee and doesn't track her time. So we just kind of estimated how much time we thought she spent on that. So about 1200 went to her. We spent about $700 on my designer. So she did all of our branding. She designed our sales page and our registration page. She designed graphics for us. I wanted something that, that stood apart from the templates everybody has in Summit in a Box. So most of them follow the templates pretty closely, but I just wanted like a special touch and I also didn't want to deal with it. So she did all of that for us, about $700 on that. I have her on retainer, which definitely helps with prices. Um, we spent $560 on speaker gifts and postcards and we made $870 in affiliate payouts, which I think I'll talk about this a little bit more, but that's much lower than I would have liked to see. So total expenses were $3,800 which means that my total launch profit, also figuring in what Jen made, was 51,000 in profit. And that's coming in over like a 10 month period. So I'm pretty happy with that. That's definitely the most I've ever profited directly from a summit. So it was really cool to see that this whole launching something through a summit works really, really well. Uh, and also it was my biggest course launch yet through a virtual summit, which I thought was really cool. I was not expecting that because my first launch of Summit in a Box made $60,000. I was like, there is no way I am going to hit that uh, through this summit. And, and we did. So it's really cool. So I want to give you guys a few details on how we went about launching Summit in a Box afterwards as well, in case you kind of want to do this. This is something I need to get more content on in Summit in a Box. So if you're a student, Hang tight. It'll probably take me a couple months, but I'm working on getting you guys more information on this. So the first thing we did to set the summit up to launch this program well was that we offered a scholarship. So in this scholarship, we basically were giving away one spot in Summit in a Box to an attendee who, number one, filled out an application, 
and two, engaged in the summit. So uh, we did kind of narrow down applications based on who we could tell kind of spent time filling it out. And then we identified the top few people who really engaged and then we kind of drew randomly from there, but it would have been a pretty obvious choice still if we uh, like were picking, handpicking people. But this scholarship made it really easy for us to mention Summit in the Box everywhere in a way that was getting people excited. So we were able to say on the registration page, we talked about the scholarship and mentioned that you could win and win a spot in Krista's signature Summit in the Box program that had over 1,000 resources for making hosting your summit easy. You know, we were able to put that in our emails. We were able to talk about it in any videos we did in the Facebook group. It made it so nice and easy and natural to talk about the program. So I would definitely recommend that. And it's just an also a nice way to give back to someone who participates in your summit. We also talked about Summit in the Box anywhere that the masterclass on the last day was mentioned. So we positioned that masterclass webinar as like our um, like signature keynote for the summit. And anywhere we mentioned it, we also said that the doors to Summit in the Box would be opening at the end of the class to one, build excitement, but two, to just be really transparent. We didn't want anyone coming and thinking it was going to be a pitch-free training. I wanted them to know going in that we would pitch at the end. Um, you can probably see with, the, with my whole strategy here that transparency and not being gross is just really important to me. Uh, something else that was not intentional was that my students and speakers would not stop talking about it. And I love them so much. So in the Facebook group, my students kept popping in and talking about how awesome Summit in a Box was. Like when I would post about the scholarship or whenever it would come up, my students were jumping in. Speakers <laughs> are amazing. I love you guys. They would not stop talking about it in the Facebook group. And it came up on every single panel. At least one of the speakers started talking about how awesome Summit in a Box was. And specifically on our Tuesday panel, we had a group of speakers. I was re I'm really close with all of them except one. And they just let loose and <laughs> would not stop talking about it. And I was sitting there like, you guys, I promise I'm not paying them to say this. Uh, but I love them so much. And I think that had to help too, right? Like so much social proof from these people that the attendees trust saying that it's an incredible program. And I'm so thankful for them. And I think that just goes to show how much connection matters when you're doing something like this. Because if I wouldn't have had a connection with those people, that wouldn't have happened. And if I didn't have a good, genuine connection, even if they know my program was awesome, they wouldn't have come in and just hyped it up like they did. So that was really cool to see. Something else we did to help the launch was that we did a behind the scenes video of a Summit in the Box the day before we opened the doors to it. I think I should kind of say I with that because that was kind of me leading the charge there. This was more of a last minute idea. With Summit in the Box, I feel like I truly can't show people how awesome it is without them seeing it for themselves. So I wanted to use this to one, get people excited about the scholarship, and that's how we positioned it. But two, just get them pumped for all the resources we had in that program. So we did that in the Facebook group the day before doors opened. Uh, I also talked about opening the doors on Instagram. So I would, you know, go on there and be like, oh yeah. And it was, oh yeah, I totally forgot to mention it, but uh, let them know on there that doors would be opening. I said for some attendees on Friday, for non-attendees on Monday, which just, you know, build a little excitement and again, be transparent. Uh, we also gave people who purchased our launch kit, so the higher tier All Access Pass, a special offer for joining. And I have to give full credit uh, for this to DeSola Davis. She's incredible. Uh, I talk about her every three seconds because she is amazing. Um, but, you know, I was, I was telling her, like, I feel gross, you know, having people buy our All Access Pass and then immediately being like, okay, now buy something else. Like, that didn't feel good to me. And I don't know if if she came up with this because I said that or if it's something she had already recommended. Either way, it was perfect. Because what I didn't want to do was have to calculate special coupon codes for everybody based on how much they paid, you know, at those different price points. There were six different price points. There was not going to be a great way for us to like send relevant coupon codes out to everybody. I didn't want to worry about that. But DeSola had me give everyone their first month of Summit in a Box payments free. It was perfect because for most people, it just kind of evened out, you know, people who paid the most uh, would have spent $50 extra, which is not a big deal. And it also just removed the risk of joining. They could join for $0. In our refund policy, we have two tiers of refund policies, but the first one is, you know, if you're in in the first seven days, you give one of our things a try. We have like a seven-day challenge. If you give it a try and don't like it, you can get your money back. 
So they were joining for free, had that seven day refund period. So I think just us showing them that we appreciated that they had already invested in us and removing that risk really helped us a lot. And I will definitely do that again. So that was really cool. Uh, something else we did to just kind of build hype was that we announced the scholarship winner immediately before the masterclass. So we went live in the Facebook group 10 minutes before the masterclass was scheduled to start, which was interesting for me trying to then jump over to the masterclass and get set up. But what that did was it got everyone interested in winning together in one spot in the Facebook group watching this video and really pumped up and excited. We announced the winners and then we're like, hey, click this link, let's go to the masterclass. And most of them did. So that was really, really cool. I would do it that way again, except maybe give myself a little bit of extra time in there because uh, I started a couple minutes late, which I hate doing, and then was kind of flustered at the beginning from trying to jump all around. Then we had the masterclass. So this was, it was a webinar but it was a webinar that delivered. This is not just like fluffy junk. So it was about, oh, 60-ish minutes of actual content, you know, overcoming objections and pain points and fears, and then, you know, giving actual value and steps, and then 15 to 20 minute pitch at the end. And that went really well. And then we had an email follow-up sequence. Well, I guess I can tell you that the masterclass, we had 11 sales live, which was more than I ever imagined. People showed up for that. Of the 27 who came, 41% of those, oh yeah, 11, right? I don't know if that's math. I think 11 people bought. I know the 41% is right. I'm pretty sure the 11 is right. And then after that, we had an email follow-up sequence. So anyone who came to the webinar, watched the replay, or had been on my email list for 60 days and was at the summit, they all got uh, like a launch sequence afterwards over the next uh, six days. So we had like a fast action bonus for them, which drove some sales. And then the cart closed the following Thursday, which drove quite a few sales too, but we had sales coming in every day. So that was really cool to see that all of that worked. So that is that is what we did to launch Summit in a Box. It was a lot of focus on building awareness around the product in a way that wasn't gross and pitching. All, we were able to talk about it in a way that was just building excitement and was really genuine. And I think the fact that it just related so closely to the summit just made it all easy and feel natural both to me and the attendees. Like I didn't have anyone come to me and say, wow, this is, you know, this is gross. You just hosted the summit to sell me this thing. Um, you know, they would have been way off base if they would have said that, because that's just not how we did it. So I hope that helps tell you a little bit about uh, how we launched and made it work. So a couple more things I want to talk about is struggles and what worked well. So let's start with the struggles, shall we? Since we just talked about really fun numbers and launching and all that stuff. So the first struggle I'll talk about is signups. So a long, for a long time during registration, I felt like my audience was the only one signing up. Like, I want to say at, by the end of the first week of speakers promoting, we only had 600 people signed up and like 400 of those were my people. So I was like, uh, what's going on? But I just did what I teach my students to do. I very genuinely let my speakers know, hey, we're struggling a bit and we could use you, we could use your help. And they did. They showed up. It is so much better to genuinely ask your speakers for help and let them know you need them than it is to be like, hey, you're not promoting. When are you promoting? They do not respond well to that. I know because I just dropped out of a summit where someone was doing that. I will say that there were still many speakers that did not promote. They just straight up didn't. Most of them were people I didn't already have a connection with. Most of the people who I knew well, like they showed up for me, right? But there were people who Jen knew and people who neither of us really knew very well. And I would say it was more of those people who didn't promote a whole lot just because of the connection wasn't there. But I will say that unfortunately, most of them didn't get great results if they promoted. And because of that, a lot of them only promoted once. And that's not their fault. I'm not saying that because it's their fault. It's the fault of the positioning of the summit, which the summit was positioned well for our goals. It just wasn't positioned well for affiliates to make money and get results. And I, I didn't know that going in. I know that now. I thought that was interesting and I definitely feel bad for the ones who did put effort into promoting and just didn't see the results that they wanted. Like calculating affiliate payouts, I was like, ah, oh, this stinks. Like I really wish I could have done better for these people. I know affiliate payouts aren't why people participate, but I still like to give them. You know, it's always fun to say, hey, thank you so much for promoting. Here's hundreds or thousands of dollars for doing so. And that's just kind of not the results we saw. So that was interesting and definitely one of our struggles. I'll say that another struggle was co-hosting. So Jen is amazing. I would have gone absolutely nuts with anyone else. Like, I don't know if we would have survived if it was anyone else, 
But I don't like having to use other tech platforms. Uh, ask when I have ideas, like ask for permission. I don't. I apparently don't like to share the stage. I learned that. I don't like to have to worry about someone else's deadlines, uh, worrying about if someone else is doing what they're supposed to. Like it's just not for me. Jen is awesome. We only had a couple hiccups here and there, but co-hosting is just not not something that I'm interested in doing again. And Jen knows this. This is not a surprise to her. Nothing she did wrong. It's literally like me and the way I work. I don't like doing it. And I'm going to have an episode all about co-hosting. Uh, it's going to be episode 98 coming out on December 8th. So stay tuned for that. But for me, that was a struggle. It had its pros and cons, but I would say, I don't want to say mostly a struggle, but I'm going to put it in the struggle category because it was just interesting and different. The next struggle I'll talk about is pricing. So this was something that Jen and I went back and forth on quite a bit. And it was partially an experiment for you guys as well. So she did want to go and have a higher price point because the audience was course creators. I wanted to keep it lower, but then ultimately uh, we decided to go with a higher price point. One, because she really wanted to. And two, because I was like, well, what the heck? If nothing else, it's an experiment. And I can let you guys know how the higher price point went. So I will say that I think personally that the pricing was too high, especially the launch kit. So the highest price for that was 247, lowest price was 127. And I just feel like that was too high for people. Adding in a payment plan definitely helped when we did that, but I will not go that high for a summit again. I just feel like it was too much for the way summits are set up and what the goal of the All Access Pass is and all of that stuff. So I think I will stick with 197 being my max price for my All Access Passes. So hopefully that helps some of you as well. Since then, I've had a couple of you know students who saw me go high or also try to go that high. And I was like, I just really recommend that you drop that down a little bit. So do what you want. But there's my morning. And that was kind of a struggle that I felt like we had. I do think that I had a part to play in our lower conversion rate as well. The next struggle, we have all kinds of struggles. I'm, I think I'm not even halfway done yet. <laughs> uh, the next struggle, struggle, I would say, is engagement in the beginning. So this is our fault. We didn't do enough to get everyone going. So I did, you know, the basics of what we teach. So we had prompts going on. Uh, we were doing live videos, things like that. But we should have realized that people needed a jump start, and we didn't. And I was talking to DeSola about this on Voxer one day, and she was like, Hold on. You know, I almost said hold my beer, but that's not, that's like off brand for both me and DeSola. She's amazing. She went live in the Facebook group where like posted a video of this contest she decided to put on for us because she's amazing and I love her uh, and she apparently loves me. Uh, she decided to give away one of her $5,000 VIP days to the attendee that showed up the most. And she gave them specific action steps. So she was like, you know, comment in the Facebook group, give the speakers shout outs, share with your friends, invite your friends, share on social media and tell us when you do it, show us and tag us and have them let, let us know when they join that they came because of you. Like she gave them all these really specific action steps and it got people fired up. And I think it also helped that I had hired her for one of those $5,000 VIP days recently. And I was able to be like, guys, yes, she really does charge that much. And yes, it's more than worth it. And people were pumped and they went nuts after that. And that gave us something else to talk about. So in addition to the scholarship, we were also able to get people engaged because of this incredible giveaway that DeSola decided to put on. Thank you again, DeSola. You're amazing. That was huge with boosting our engagement. That was something we didn't expect. She decided to do that. Like whatever day that video was posted in the group, <laughs> like that's the day that we decided that that was happening. Uh, and she's, I am so thankful for her for doing that. So I think in the future, I would may, I, I think you could use your scholarship for that and just position it differently. So I think we just could have positioned our scholarship better. So instead of making it look like it was going to be kind of random and application-based, it should have been, yes, fill out an application so we know you're interested, but here are things you need to do if you want to win. And it could have been those things, same things from DeSola's giveaway. And she's just awesome. So engagement was a struggle, but she saved us from ourselves on that one. The next struggle I'll talk about is sponsors. So we tried to get sponsors. Uh, I shouldn't say we, Jen tried to get sponsors. Sponsors stress me out, like outreach, cold outreach, where people are probably going to say no, stresses me out beyond measure. So I, I was like, I tapped out of that one and let Jen go ahead and do that. So we tried to get sponsors for a couple of months. We, you know, had someone interested in getting on a call and it just never happened. So we didn't have any sponsors until literally the middle of the summit. So Nicole Ware of Empreneur saw how awesome everyone was and decided to jump in. It had kind of been on her radar. We had been in talks with her about it for a month or two and she did decide to uh, do a sponsorship on like 
Tuesday of the summit. And part of that was that she added a sponsorship training for our launch kit purchasers, which was a big hit. So she added a bonus for people who purchased our higher tier all access pass. And it was like a workshop on getting summit sponsors, which was really cool. That will be included in future editions as well. We threw in uh, an email to my email list and like that stuff as well. So we did end up with a sponsor, but it wasn't like the way we expected at all. And so sponsors are still a struggle for me. Something else I will say didn't go well was not having a chat box. So this was another experiment, my first summit where I didn't have a chat box and it goes against what I teach in Summit in a Box, but I wanted to try it. So I will say that it made Summit Week way easier. Not having to monitor chat boxes all day long was amazing. Like I loved the heck out of it. And in place of chat boxes, we had like a a thread in the Facebook group for each presentation. So on each presentation page was a button that was, I don't remember what it said, something about, you know, go chat in the Facebook group and it linked directly to a thread for that presentation, which was cool. And like speakers didn't have to show up. It was easier for us, like I said, but I really feel like it killed engagement. I will say though, with a summit this small, the chat boxes might have been like awkwardly quiet. Like there might have been speakers in there being like, there's no one here. Does everyone hate my presentation? Did I do something wrong? When really it's just like, no, there's just not enough people signed up. So like I could go either way with this, but in the future when I know I'm going to have a bigger summit, I will definitely have chat boxes because I really miss the engagement on those. I do feel like it hurt our engagement overall quite a bit to not have that. All right, the next struggle I'll say was putting off launch related stuff until the last minute. So I was working on launch automations, writing emails, tweaking my slides literally until the evening before the launch. So Thursday night, I was still working on this. If you know anything about me, you know that's not how I work. I get things done early. I don't like like, you know, getting up on deadlines, anything like that. But someone else fell behind on something pretty big. And it affected everything else, including this, because people who weren't supposed to have to help with something were having to help with something, including myself. And this just fell to the wayside because the due date was farther out. And I also, part of it was also my fault, that I did not anticipate how long it would take me to figure out how to launch to all the different segments I had in a way that felt good to me. So I actually launched to five different segments. Uh, I think it was, let's see if I can get all these right. People who came to the webinar during the summit, uh, people who were in the summit, not at the webinar, and I'm on, on my email list for at least 60 days. People on my email list who were not signed up for the summit and did sign up for a different masterclass. People on my wait list and people in none of those things. <laughs> so like, it took me a while to map all that out, figure out all the automations, tweak the different emails, get all them scheduled. Like it was... It was a situation, but we got it. So I will just say that that was an overall struggle, putting that off until the last minute. It like it worked, it went fine, but it was really stressful for me. It made me work overtime hours, you know, trade some time with my family, which I never liked doing even during a summit. And it was just a little bit more stressful than it needed to be. The next thing I'll say that was a struggle was something we kind of already talked about, but I'll just call it out on its own. Well, it was having affiliates with a topic that wasn't geared towards all access pass sales. So like like I said, the All Access Pass just didn't perform how we're used to, and especially to other people's audiences. I think my audience responded well because they're used to learning about summits from me, but these other course creators whose audiences maybe aren't as in tune with summits, it was just a struggle for them. And since I had a co-host, I couldn't award affiliate payouts for Summit in a Box to our speakers because then I wouldn't have gotten anything, <laughs> you know? Uh, I had to get something too for this. So moving forward without a co-host, with a different summit, by the way, she gets to keep this brand. Uh, I will make sure my speakers can get awarded for Summit in the back sales. So the tech will have to be set up differently than what we had this time, which is fine. It will be simpler. Uh, but I will have my speakers set up that they can get uh, maybe 30-ish percent of sales on Summit in a box for who they refer, because that would just make it so much more worth it to them. And it's something I wish we would have been able to do uh, with this one. The last struggle I'll talk about was having sessions open to everyone on the last day. So the first four days of the summit were the regular presentations. Then we had a few, uh, two live sessions per day for people who purchased the All Access Pass. There weren't any live sessions for people on the free tier until Friday. And I thought that was going to be awesome. I thought it was going to get them excited and get them showing up and get everyone pumped up for the masterclass. And so we had a co-working and networking session for free people and, you know, people who paid could come too. But we saved that for the last day. And really only people who upgraded showed up. There were not very many people who had not already been coming to the previous ones who showed up to this one open to everyone. And honestly, I was kind of disappointed, you know, when there were only, I don't know, 10-ish 
people on the networking session that day. It was open to over 1,200 people and 10 showed up, most of them who had already been coming, which I think was cool. Like it showed me that those people loved them and wanted to do more of them. But I was really hoping we'd get some fresh faces in to, you know, let more people connect and just like give the people on with the free tickets more of an experience. And they just didn't come. So it could have been that the people who upgraded were just our most engaged people. They were just more likely to show up anyways. But it also could have been that, this is something that an attendee pointed out to me, it could have been that we would have seen a better turnout if these live sessions would have been on the first day instead, when people were excited and you know things like that. But for me, like the entire point of the final day was to get everyone engaged before the webinar. So honestly, I don't know yet what I'm going to change about that moving forward. I just know that the way we did it did not work to get free ticket holders engaged. It got our, you know, all access pass people engaged or kept them engaged, but it did not do much for the free ticket holders. So those are all kinds of things that did not work well. This episode is getting real nice and long here. Holy smokes. Let's move into though. What did work well? So there's a couple of these things that I've already hinted at, but I want to go over them for you guys here. So the first thing that worked well was having connections with almost all of the speakers and genuinely caring about these people. That relationship made them want to show up even when things ended up smaller than we anticipated. So every Friday, I send my speakers updates of exact numbers. They get to see exactly how many people are registered and all that good stuff. And I hated sending those this time because I was like, they're going to be so disappointed. They are going to, you know, that we have these smaller numbers. They're not going to want to be a part of it. They're not going to want to promote. But instead, they responded to that and they tried harder. They tried harder to show up for us. No one wanted to back out. No one wanted to cancel their spot on a panel because the summit was smaller than they expected. Uh, it made them show up. So I would say having connections with my speakers just benefited everyone. It was really nice for me to have people who had my back. It was really fun for them to be able to have me as a mutual connection because now lots of them are connecting, which has been so fun. And I think it was good for the audience as well because like most of the people were pretty cohesive for the most part. Uh, something else that worked well was releasing presentations at the same time each day rather than dripping them out hour by hour. Honestly, I do think both are fine. And this was another thing I wanted to experiment with for you guys. But I will say that I loved not having to worry about tech and testing them every hour on the hour. Instead, I tested once right in the morning and then I knew they were all live and working like they were supposed to all day long. I do think it reduced engagement a little bit, but I would try it again. Something else I've seen people do is release presentations all at the same time like we did and then still have, you know, every hour one of the speakers is live in the chat box on one of the pages or something like that to put in that live engagement. So I'm not sure how that would work. You know, I can see the show up rate for that being lower because of it. But overall, I really liked having all the presentations released at the same time. Another thing that worked really well was having short presentations. And I got to say thanks to Emily Walker for this one. This was all her. So in the past, I've had my summit or my speakers create presentations between 30 and 45 minutes. But in the very early stages of our summit planning, after we pitched our speakers and everything, I got on my podcast interview with Emily. That was episode 81. So you can go to summithosthangout.com slash 081. And we were talking about learning design for summits. And she was like, People, like, they struggle to pay attention once you hit 17 minutes. If you're teaching somebody for that long, that's the point where they, like, can't take in any more information. So summit presentations should be between, like, 10 and 20 minutes. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I don't know about that. Like, can they teach? Like, can we teach good information in that amount of time? But then I thought about the planathon, Amber McHugh's planathon, and they have really short presentations, and I love it. Like, that's the only event that I like wait for every year and want to tune into the presentations for and do because they're short. So like being able to connect the dots there really helped me feel more comfortable with this. So we updated all our speakers like, hey, uh, you know, requirements have changed. Presentation should be between 15 and 20 minutes. And that was amazing. Attendees went crazy about how much they love these short presentations, how helpful they were, how it really helped overwhelm to, you know, be able to watch the presentation and take action right away. And they loved it. So I will definitely do short presentations moving forward. You will never see me do 30 to 45 minute uh, presentation requirements in a summit I host again. They will all be, honestly, even 10 to 15 minutes, but I might, I might do 10 to 20 moving forward. All right, next, the next thing that worked really well was having the scholarship. So we already went over this, but I'll just say it was huge in building awareness around Summit in the Vax. It let us reward an awesome attendee who showed the heck up during the summit. And it just, you know, was just a great way to talk about Summit in a Box and not feel like we were pitching. 
The extra giveaway from Nisola also really worked to boost engagement. It was unexpected. It was just her being awesome, but it skyrocketed engagement throughout the event like I talked about. And then I also hinted at this earlier, but the panels worked really well. I was not sure about panels. I didn't. I did not really want to do them, to be honest. Jen did, but I loved them so much. I was scared that people wouldn't show up. I was scared they wouldn't want to do them. The way we did these was in our speaker intake form when we were asking for their information, we asked, would you be interested in hosting a live Ask Me Anything session? So our idea was that we'd have a couple per day for people who purchased our launch kit. It was just going to be like one speaker doing an Ask Me Anything session. But then like 2022, I think, of our speakers said yes. And we were like, um, how are we going to fit all of these? How are we going to fit 22 sessions in the summit? So we switched to panels instead. And I loved that. So uh, we did have a tech issues one day. We had a lot of speakers who were having trouble staying connected and I felt terrible. It was a crappy experience for those speakers. It was not a cohesive panel for the attendees who were there. But other than that, they were really, really awesome and I had a fun time hosting them. There was so much good value, especially when these people could bounce ideas off of each other. It was so cool to see. I will say that one of our biggest struggles with the panels was building groups that were cohesive. And I do think it was a little bit of an issue, uh, you know, because we were like, okay, these people want to do panels. How can we fit them all, you know, into a topic that kind of makes sense? And like, we just didn't in some cases. Like there was one day where we had topics, people talking about everything from custom boxes to like conversion rates. And it was just hard to do it. So I will do that differently in the future. I'm going to decide panel topics first and then let my speakers decide if they want to participate in that specific topic. So rather than trying to, you know, include questions that would let everyone talk about their area of expertise, it's going to be like, hey, if you would want to talk about this topic, even if it's not related to your presentation directly, you know, here's the panel you can be a part of. So I would do that a little bit differently, but the panels were a huge hit. I love them. Speakers love them and like scheduled coffee chats with each other afterwards. Attendees love them too. So that was great. I'll also say that the hot seat for the all access pass holders went really well also. So I was not expecting very many, many people to show up for this. I think we only had three or four people actually submit questions, but we had 20 or 30 people that came to the hot seat call, which was more than had been coming to our co-working sessions or networking sessions, which I totally wasn't expecting. So people came to show up and learn and give each other feedback and chime in. And it was really cool. So that was something that's something I will do again in the future. And the last thing I'll say that worked really well was the webinar launch. So, you know, doing a webinar at the end of the summit, right at the end, not waiting a couple weeks for people to forget about why they were excited, doing it right at the end of the summit was really great. And then just adding kind of a makeshift launch for my non-summit audience was also something that I thought went really well. So I will give you a quick overview of my biggest lessons and then we will wrap this one up. So I have two major lessons I learned from the summit. First is that it's different to position a summit to sell a course than it is to position a summit to sell an all access pass. I didn't realize how differently things were positioned and that you kind of had to lean one way or the other in most cases. And that was a big lesson for me. I'm very glad I learned it because not only is it good for me, but it's good for someone who teaches about summits to know that, you know, and to, to have firsthand experience with that. So I think that's important. So going forward with your own summits, decide which one is your focus. It doesn't mean like if you're going to launch your product at the end, it doesn't mean you still can't sell an all access pass. We still made $15,000 on that, but don't feel crappy about it. If your focus is your product launch and you don't make like 50K through your all access pass, right? So you just kind of decide where your focus is and position a summit in a way that's going to serve that goal better. And my second lesson is just how much it pays to treat your speakers well. This event would not be what it was if I didn't have solid and genuine relationships with almost all of the speakers. I'm so grateful for them. That's something that I really got woke up to in the summit. If you have the launch kit from the summit, go watch the second day's panel, which was about uh, engagement, I believe, or the attendee experience, something like that. Watch how our relationships like come to life in that and how much it added to the event. It was incredible. And I was a part of an event recently. Like I said, there's going to be an episode that comes out either right before or right after this one that talks about this more, but we were not treated well as speakers. I dropped out, which I've never done before. I know so many other people either dropped out or are like, I'm never working with this person again. And I don't want my, any of my speakers to feel that way about me. So it pays to treat your people well. You realize that you can't do this without them and show them that you know that. 
So I hope this episode was helpful. Holy smokes. I think this is our longest episode yet, um, but I hope you guys loved it. So thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Thank you for those of you who were part of South of the Summit. I appreciate you guys so much. Welcome to everyone new who was a part of the Summit and is now inside of Summit in a Box. You guys are all incredible. For show notes and resources we mentioned in this episode, head to summithosthangout.com slash 090. In the next episode, we'll be chatting about how to estimate, analyze, and improve your virtual summit conversion rates. So be sure to stay tuned for that. Before you go, check out my free masterclass covering the three-part framework to triple your monthly revenue with the virtual summit while building your list for free. So in this class, we cover the secret to creating a plan you can actually follow to make your summit happen, even if your business is already too busy, how to host a profitable event and land expert speakers without a huge audience of your own, and how to use the three-part profitable summit system to triple your monthly revenue and the size of your email list. And you can join that class at summithosthangout.com slash class. Now go out and take action to plan, strategize, and launch your profitable online summit.